So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Author Addendum Conundrum, Trying to Solve Author Rights Negotiations Mysteries, uh, presented by Lauren Bile. I'm Lise Berin. I'm one of the program officers at Carl Canadian Association of Research Libraries. Before we start, I'd like to take just a quick moment to acknowledge the Indigenous land on which we, as Canadian library workers, do our work. I live and work in Nova Scotia, which has been known for much, much longer as Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq, Wallastuk, and Passamaquoddy peoples signed with the British Crown way back in 1726. I try to remind myself regularly that we are all bound by these treaties. We are all treaty people. I'm also going to run through just a few quick housekeeping items that I'm sure you're all getting used to by now uh, attending these webinars. So you've all been per uh, muted upon entry and you are encouraged to um, use the chat feature if you have any technical difficulties or if you have comments or resources you'd like to suggest. Just make sure, I think the default is just to send to uh, the panelists, so you might want to switch that so that everyone can see uh, things that you put in the chat. But for questions, we ask that you use the Q&A feature, which is a separate feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, Lauren will be taking those questions at the end of the session. And you can ask those in French or English. We, as the Carl staff, can help with translations. Alors, uh, les questions peuvent être posées en français ou en anglais, comme vous le préférez. On pourra aider à traduire uh, uh, la question pour Lauren. Finally, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available after the session. Uh, these slides have been posted in French and English on the CARL website, and I believe there are links to these in the chat for you to, uh, to use. Uh, finally, there, is a also, there are also links to the CARL Code of Conduct that we ask that you read and abide by. So, our speaker today is Lauren Bile, and she's the Copyright and License Licensing Librarian at the University of Waterloo. And the research that Lauren is presenting today received funding from Carl in 2017 as part of our practicing librarian category uh, of our uh, research and librarianship granting program. And I hope you'll check out our website to learn more about that in case you have some research projects that you would like to submit to this program at some point. Carl's proud to have been able to contribute to the successful completion of this project and to provide a channel for the recipient to share her results through our webinar series. The focus of Lauren's study was researcher experiences with copyright negotiations and publication, their use of author's agenda and publisher's practices and views on author's agenda. So these are research topics that have really not received enough attention. And since Carl has been responsible for adapting author's agenda for the Canadian context, we are really quite interested in Lauren's findings, uh, which she's going to present today, along with some recommendations for future copyright education, use of addenda, and discussions with publishers. Very interestingly, some of you have, may have noticed an announcement earlier today by Coalition S uh, that states that under Plan S, researchers that are funded by Coalition S funders will be required to apply a CC BY license on either the author accepted manuscripts or the version of record of their uh, papers. A solution that we hope will bring about some changes to what is the norm in, uh, in author rights and scholarly publishing practices. So maybe we can have a little discussion on that during the Q&A at the end. But first, I'm going to hand over to Lauren. Thanks again for agreeing to share your findings with us and please take it away. Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I'll go over the uh, uh, sort of the a bit of the problem behind why I wanted to uh, do this research, and then um, talk about how I how I set it up and the the results and next steps. Um, let's see here. There we go. Okay, so uh, the main problem sort of started around the time that a, a bunch of colleagues and I um, were offering. Uh, 
tri-agency open access policy workshops. Um, and we were trying to help researchers comply with the uh, OA policy requirements. Um, and uh, as could be expected, many of them were looking to do so without spending any of their grant funds. Um, and uh, um, as we know, uh, researchers can ask for funds uh, from the tri-agencies for a article processing charges, um, but there's been some sort of mixed results in terms of whether or not they're granted additional funds on their grants um, to do so. So they're really looking to be able to comply without um, uh, spending any money on APCs. Um, and so, and they also want to publish in the journal of their choice, of course. Um, and so when we were exploring um, green open access options with these researchers, um, there were a number of them who were concerned that they were going to be limited from publishing in the journal of their choice because that journal didn't have a policy that uh, complied with the tri-agency open access policy. And so I wanted to get a better sense of what scope that issue had. So I had a look at the um, journal uh, title list for a number of large publishers, including those sort of uh, big five uh, plus Oxford and Cambridge, um, to see what their embargoes were on each of those titles um, and what percentage of the overall holdings um, uh, had a policy that didn't comply with the tri-agency open access uh, requirements. And so about 28.6% of journals with those publishers don't comply uh, with the open access policy, which is a pretty large percentage um, in terms of uh, when you think of how many researchers are going to be submitting articles to those journals and how many of them might be um, tri-agency or otherwise funded that, re that requires a, an open access um, publication. Um, and so what the solution was at the time, or what I thought the solution was, was what well, we'll suggest to researchers that they use the Spark Author addendum as a way to negotiate their rights and uh, remind them that uh, copyright transfer agreements and uh, copyright policies um, that publishers hold can be negotiable. Um, but really, um, what I found was that researchers are um, very reticent to uh, go to their publisher with any kind of problem and really don't want to um, enter the negotiation process for a number of reasons, um, including these three that I have here that I've heard in person from folks, um, that they're afraid that publishers will reject their work on suggestion of negotiation of their rights, that they're afraid that their reputation would be tarnished so that the journal or their colleagues would look down on them for um, causing trouble in the, in the process of publishing. Um, and uh, a, a large number of them that thought, well, of course the publisher isn't going to take me seriously, and so trying to negotiate um, is going to be a waste of my time. Um, and so, and more, more often than not, really what they wanted me to say was, yes, X publisher will definitely accept uh, the Spark Author addendum. Um, you definitely won't have any problems and um, there's not gonna be any risk there, which is something that I couldn't do. I had no evidence um, either through research or um, through anecdotes from other um, researchers that this was the case. So um, I was looking for um, what other people are doing and, and if there was any research that uh, could help me out. Um, so my first step was to look uh, at what other institutions were doing, um, looking at their author rights guides and copyright pages for, for some help. Um, and so for, for context, um, just in case uh, you're wondering why I start with the U15, um, I started out uh, my co-op library career as a uh, in bibliometrics and um, U15 was always where we started in terms of comparable institutions for Waterloo. And so that's where I get that sort of perspective from. Um, there may be other better lists of institutions to have started with, but that's that's where why I started where I started. Um, so of those institutions, um, 10 of them uh, suggest using the Spark addendum in a way that implies it as a solution, um, including Waterloo. So I'll the author guide that I have still sort of listed in that way, and it's something that I intend on changing. Um, but just 
in a way that says, if you want to retain your rights, use the Spark author addendum, which sounds great. Um, but uh, in practice, I think researchers find it a little bit difficult to, to do that in terms of when do I use it in the process and how exactly um, do I attach it to um, my agreement, especially if it's in a click through form or something along those lines. Um, and so in having a look at others guides, uh, Queens in Manitoba, um, do use wording in terms of using the addendum as a tool for negotiation. And Queens and McGill had provided some more detailed instructions on how to use the addendum during the publication process. So both things that I think um, could be added, um, something that I'll consider adding to my guide to, to help people through the process. Um, None of the institutions provided any kind of evidence, either based in research or anecdotes, um, that addendums were being accepted or being used by their researchers. Um, so no further guidance there. Um, but just as a caveat to that information, really, I only looked at institutional websites. I didn't talk to anyone in, in person. And um, I totally understand that uh, information on an institutional website might differ widely from the kind of information that you're able to provide in one-on-one -on -one communications or in workshops that is a little bit more nuanced. Um, so the next step was then to look for uh, published research on addendum use and acceptance. Um, so I did find some studies on uh, researcher copyright knowledge and behaviors, but only the one study uh, that specifically spoke about use of addenda which was Austin, Heffernan, and Davis uh, in 2008. Um, and their study was uh, broadly on open access and, and researcher uh, knowledge and behaviors um, in, uh, at, for academic and research staff in Australian universities. Um, and what they found was that uh, of the 509 responses to their survey, 87 uh, participants had used an addendum before, and 79 of those 87 had their addenda successfully accepted by the publisher, which is a really great result, I think. Um, but one caveat um, occurred that because the study was published in 2008, um, research was likely done you know, a fair bit before that. This may have been at a time before publishers had changed their copyright agreements or their policies on you know, what they were doing in terms of accepting addenda. So I, I'm trying to sort of take those results um, with, with a bit of a grain of salt in terms of there's been such a lot of change since that time um, in this space that um, we might need uh, new information. So in terms of the other uh, research, the, the content that uh, on copyright knowledge and behaviors that I thought might inform you know, what we know or what we can guess that researchers will do in terms of using addendums, um, we have a few studies that talk about uh, researchers that find that researchers don't usually negotiate uh, their agreements. So I don't think this is surprising to any of us, but um, generally folks are, a, agreeing to their copyright transfer agreements as is um, often without review. Um, the other um, uh, few studies I found talked about the, um, looked at whether or not researchers were um, understanding the agreements they sign. And they tried to figure this out by looking at the differences between the agreements that um, were likely in place for uh, a specific publisher and the choices made by authors when self-archiving. So Antelman, Covey, and Morris um, in separate uh, research found that often authors were making choices that directly contravened the agreements they were signing. So for example, depositing the version of record in an institutional repository or subject repository when the agreement was clear that that wasn't allowed. Um, so between the fact that we were understanding that researchers aren't usually negotiating their agreements, um, they may not be understanding the agreements or be, um, or if they are understanding them, um, they're indicating that they don't um, necessarily follow them to the letter. Um, so it's a, I think these are a good indication that there's more space for awareness about, um, about this and about and an indicator that folks um, are probably not using addendum or, um, or if they are, 
um, they're, they're few and far between. So because there wasn't much research about actual use of addenda, um, I wanted to see if there was any sort of informal conversations going on. Um, and so uh, I had a look at the ACRL scholarly communications listserv um, in their uh, online archive, there were five questions asked uh, over uh, many years, 2003 to present, um, about others' experiences with addenda. Um, folks wanted to know if they were accepted, uh, what did using them look like in practice? Um, again, were authors being rejected due to use? So I think, you know, a lot of the questions that I've heard from researchers are probably, you know, more very widespread in terms of folks having a lot of fear about the power relationships that are in play when they're um, trying to get published. Um, in response to those queries, uh, some folks shared uh, successful anecdotes, uh, examples of acceptance, um, but really there were lots of uh, talk that there there wasn't anything um, published about. Um, about whether or not addenda were being used and accepted. Uh, in addition to uh, the ACRL scholarly communications listserv, I had a look uh, just uh, to see if there were any anyone, any authors publishing online about their experiences, and I found two. Um, so uh, Perakakis uh, described uh, the negotiation process with Springer in which they uh, successfully negotiated for a reduced embargo period, um, and Vandegrift described their negotiation process with Taylor and Francis. Uh, again, a successful um, negotiation process which resulted in um, immediate release of the uh, accepted manuscript on publication. Um, but really, these are the only uh, two examples that I could find of authors describing their experiences with negotiation. Um, yeah. Okay, so that brings me to the research I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to know, um, are researchers using author addenda to negotiate their copyright agreements? And are publishers accepting them? In order to get this information from researchers, I developed a survey of questions uh, using Qualtrics, and uh, I sent it to faculty associations, graduate associations, and postdoctoral associations at U15 institutions. Um, were I to do this uh, research again, I would use an entirely different method, as many of these associations had concerns about uh, forwarding uh, studies to their members, um, some in response to Canadian anti-spam legislation, and others just in terms of a, an internal policy that the association had set about not forwarding uh, research onto their members. Uh, in later on, I had changed my research ethics application to include sending uh, the survey via copyright uh, listservs and, and through copyright librarians. Um, but uh, generally, I think a, a, a snowball method probably would have been better using social media and, and other sources. Um, so that's uh, that was how we sort of uh, reached the uh, researchers through those associations, the ones that were willing to participate. And then in terms of publishers, uh, a series of questions uh, were developed to create an interview uh, that would be done by telephone, uh, asking publishers about their copyright policies and whether or not they accepted addenda. Um, and so I reached out to publisher representatives at uh, 15 different organizations, um, sort of your, your main, um, uh, large uh, publishing organizations and a few extras, for example, IEEE, ACS, Oxford, and Cambridge, um, as well I reached out to the Society of Scholarly Publishers and the International Association of STM Publishers to see if they would share uh, the request for interview. So in terms of uh, participation, um, each question in the researcher survey had a bit of a different response rate overall, but um, 85 people uh, responded to the researcher survey um, pretty well. 
Um, of the 15 publishers and publishing organizations contacted, only two publishers agreed to participate. Um, and so uh, the publishers, um, many of them didn't respond at all. Um, of those who did respond, um, a number of them indicated that they weren't comfortable sharing that kind of information. Um, and some of them that responded had difficulty finding someone that they thought was appropriate to answer the question. So um, they, they were trying to figure out, well, do we get someone, do we get a journal editor, or do we get someone from the legal team, or someone who responds to queries about open access uh, to respond? And so sometimes uh, in, it, in the effort to find someone appropriate, the, uh, the publisher just decided that they would rather not participate than, than try to figure out who best to represent them. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, two publishers agreed. So in terms of the results, uh, the re for the researcher survey, um, it revealed that awareness of author rights and um, the availability of addenda in terms of negotiation continue to be an issue. Um, folks just aren't aware uh, of, these, of these things. And um, so for 84% of the participants, um, they indicated that they've never tried to negotiate an agreement. Um, and 86% of participants indicated that they were unaware that author addenda existed. Um, so part of the survey was um, telling participants what author addenda were and asking if they were um, aware of anything like that before uh, they participated in the study. So they did have some information about uh, what an addenda was, so I'm hoping that that's an, an accurate representation. Um, of the folks that um, indicated that they were grant funded, um, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask of people was, um, or to figure out, was whether or not um, any kind of uh, grant funding or awareness of open access requirements had an influence over whether or not a person was um, going to uh, negotiate an agreement or whether or not that had an influence over them having more information about uh, their rights or their uh, requirements. Um, and unfortunately, what I found was that uh, of those folks that indicated they were grant funded, um, uh, sixty nine percent of them weren 't on the right track to comply with their funding agreement, so uh, thirty percent of the participants indicated their research was funded and it was funded by either the tri agencies or NIH um, but they indicated that um, they didn 't have to make their research open access um, so they were asked two separate questions: are you funded or sorry three are you funded, who are you funded by, and do you have to make your research open access? And so, unless there's something I'm missing there, 30% um, of participants understanding of their requirements was in clear contradiction with their funder policies. Um, in addition, a further 39% of participants weren't sure if there was a requirement to make their work OA. So they'd indicated they were funded by the tri-agencies or NIH, um, but at the end of the day, they weren't sure if they had to make their work OA. So these folks still have an opportunity at some point to reach out to a colleague or uh, a librarian and get some guidance on that and, and hopefully get back on track to complying with their agreement. Um, but at the point of them answering the, the survey, um, they weren't on the right track to making sure that uh, they had complied. Um, in looking for a relationship between um, their knowledge of an open access requirement and uh, whether or not they were willing to negotiate an agreement, there was no relationship found there. So a, so a person who uh, was aware of their open access requirement and a person who wasn't are equally likely um, to try to negotiate. In terms of actual awareness of addenda, um, only eight participants were aware. Um, and of those eight, three had attempted to use an addenda while publishing, and two of those three had their addenda accepted. Um, so obviously, because we have a very small um, uh, pool of participants, we can't really generalize these results in any way. Um, but it is promising, I think, that of the of the three, we have some evidence that 
they're being accepted. Um, I obviously would like to um, have more information about uh, you know, how these folks used addenda um, and whether or not they were sort of accepted as is or changes were made, but uh, this is all the information we have on that. In terms of the interviews done with publishers, um, they were both done with large multinational publishers and they both do not accept the Spark author addendum. Um, they were both publishers were basically on the same track. A lot of what they had to say was incredibly similar. You'd almost think that they had um, uh, had a talk beforehand or something like that. Um, but uh, both of them mentioned um, the importance of that research half-life or, the, or uh, the, the time that it takes to, for a piece of research to reach uh, half of the downloads that we'll get in its lifetime um, in, in regards to how long that they want the embargo to be and indicating that because of their understanding of research half-life they didn't want to reduce the an embargo that had been set um, uh, without uh, receiving an APC or something along those lines um, because it, it impacted the return on the research. Both publishers thought that their current policies, so their current copyright or sharing policies, made uh, author addenda unnecessary. Um, so that they, th they thought that because they had policies that allowed for green open access, um, even with you know, the, those longer embargoes, that um, that meant that having, uh, putting an addenda in place um, didn't make sense. They also indicated that very few authors attempted to negotiate. Um, so uh, publisher one indicated about 1% uh, of all authors and publisher two uh, indicated about one to two a week. Neither publisher had hard data on, on this. So this was sort of their guesstimate of the number of authors that attempted to negotiate. Um, one of the things I have in mind is that to while 1% of a large multinational publisher's um, authors attempting to negotiate may still seem small, um, it's still likely to be hundreds of authors. Um, and so I think it's still important to sort of dig deeper into what's happening there. Um, finally, both publishers focused on how difficult it is to make sure authors are aware of everything they need to be aware of um, in terms of their responsibilities um, for funder uh, ag agreements, their responsibilities for copyright agreements, while still maintaining sort of a streamlined publishing process. So a quote from publisher one, how can we surface the right options at the right time and still make the process seamless? And in a way, um, while I have a little bit less sympathy for publishers than I do for, for our systems as libraries, um, I can sympathize with that uh, a little bit in that, you know, we have so much trouble with access and discovery and making sure that folks are getting the right information at the right time to make good choices and to have access without um, uh, any sort of issue. Um, so I, I can see how that kind of process um, gets a little bit difficult, that said. I do think publishers have way more control over that process um, than, than libraries do, and I, I would expect that it would be easier for them to make changes to their back-end um, publishing um, portals to, to make these things a little bit more um, easy to understand. Um, both publishers did talk about the uh, being proud of the information that they had made available on their websites to uh, educate authors on copyright and sharing policies um, and they were talking about attempts to integrate those into the publication portals um, and in terms of making sure that information is available at the same time and so uh, perhaps libraries and and publishers can have a conversation about um, you know streamlining the publication process in a way that uh, helps researchers get that information and connect with the people that they need to connect with. So in terms of um, next steps, um, as I mentioned, um, with only 85 uh, people responding in terms of researchers, we definitely need uh, more research on, on the author side of things and on the publisher side of things. So I think 
um, a change in, in method uh, would certainly be more likely to attract more researchers, but it seems to me that uh, publishers are sort of hard to nail down in terms of um, participating because of their lack of comfort sharing this information in a public way. Um, uh, clearly, there's still need for more education in terms of awareness of copyright uh, in publishing, open access requirements. Um, I know that for many of us, um, author rights, scholarly communication, and open access are small parts of our jobs that are sometimes uh, done off the side of our desks or in addition to more pressing or hi more highly prioritized um, uh, requirements. So um, trying to figure out a way to get that information out there in a more uh, seamless way um, is probably important. I've been thinking about um, collaborating with our Office of Research in terms of having this uh, sort of embedded in education about um, complying with tri-agency policies, period. Um, so instead of having a separate library session about tri-agency open access policy requirements, having that sort of right in the rest of their education about uh, compliance. Um, also considering the way that we change, uh, the way that we talk to researchers about author addenda. So moving a, uh, away from uh, the uh, language talking about the author addenda as, uh, as a solution in and of itself and switching the focus to negotiation. Um, what helps researchers be a successful negotiator? What kind of um, tools can we um, empower them with to, you know, think about negotiation in a different way while saying, you know, here you can use the addenda as one uh, piece of negotiation, but if you don't understand it or if you don't feel comfortable using it, here are some other skills um, that you might uh, employ to have a conversation with your publisher about this. Um, and then uh, last but certainly not least, um, having a conversation nationally. Um, I think it's fairly well documented that researchers as individuals are, are pretty uncomfortable in this space. And so finding ways for libraries, for the tri-agency funders and other funders to have a conversation with publishers to make exceptions um, for tri-agency funding, funded researchers. Um, uh, and I was thinking, for example, that uh, an organization like the Canadian Research Knowledge Network or CRKN um, has uh, already has relationships with many of the large publishers and might be a good place uh, in coordination with the tri-agencies to start having a more in-depth conversation about um, what researchers uh, need from publishers in order to comply. Similar to some of the conversations um, I would assume was had between NIH and some of the publishers to get folks to the point where NIH publications are automatically deposited in PubMed Central, for example. Um, and then one additional thing here, um, before we get to questions, I just want to share, um, oh, apologies. I have created a author rights negotiation results Google Sheets, um, and I'm kind of hoping um, that this could become a tool um, that we share with researchers who we are aware are negotiating and that folks can track uh, results with. So the um, I've added the Perkakis and Vandegrift examples here, um, but just a way to collect information on um, who are researchers negotiating with, uh, what was the process uh, to, to do so, what were your results, um, so that we do have some evidence when we are asked by researchers, well, you know, has, do you know anybody who has successfully negotiated with Springer? Or, or something like that, um, so that there's something that we can use to talk to researchers and then perhaps to talk to publishers as well if we notice a trend um, of difficult negotiations. And that's all I have for today. So uh, just uh, questions. Thanks so much, Lauren. Uh, while people uh, reflect on what they'd like to ask you, I've got a couple of notes so I can ask you one and then I think we have somebody else who's ready to, to uh, who's got their hand raised. So I'll ask you this quick one and then we'll move into uh, participant questions. 
So one thing I wasn't clear on, did, were you asking publishers um, whether they were open to use of the addenda solely, or did you ask them more generally whether they were uh, they would sometimes accept changes to the uh, the agreement? So, yeah, so I asked um, both kinds of questions. So I did ask specifically about the Spark author addendum um, to both of the publishers, and both of them said, no, they don't accept um, the Spark author addendum. Publisher 2 indicated that they do accept uh, an addendum created by the World Bank, um, although I don't know, I imagine it's very specific group using that. Um, but I also asked them uh, what uh, about their how many um, authors were trying to negotiate and what their process was for that, and both of them indicated it's very much a case by case, um, editor by editor decision making process, which I think is really the meat of of the conversation, and I think perhaps a survey of journal editors might be a better way to, to get at that, although I have no idea where you would get started. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we had some people with their hands raised, but I don't see them raised anymore. So we'll go to the Q&A where we do have a question from Michelle. I'm wondering if you can speak a bit more about the impacts of editorial management software processes. I've often thought that copyright transfer agreements integrated into editorial management software processes as a web form don't really invite negotiation the same way as a PDF document emailed by an actual person might. Although I can see that there are benefits in the ways that the forms sometimes surface the kinds of exceptions that are available. Um, I'm in health, so I often see NIH grant exceptions included in these forms, but no CIHR ones, for example. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything in, um, like, I don't think I have any sort of special knowledge about the impacts of um, editorial management software processes, other than that both publishers indicated that they were using um, an online click-through um, process for their agreements. And I, I, I would imagine, by and large, that's sort of where publishers are going these days. And I do, I would agree that it definitely doesn't invite negotiation in the same way a PDF document uh, emailed would. Um, Publisher One indicated that there was some part of their um, uh, online process that allowed for upload of an addendum. Um, so that to mm -hmm. me is encouraging, although I don't know in practice how visible that is, how easy to understand it is. Having not been in the back end of their particular system, I, I wouldn't be able to attest to, you know, whether or not it's actually helpful or just sort of a, a piecemeal thing that they put in there to appease folks. <laughs> I do see we have a comment uh, in the chat as well uh, from Sophie Saint Cyr saying, "I'm really it uh, was really interesting. Unfortunately, I'm not surprised that researchers don't know about the addendum. I, I must say that I was a bit surprised." Uh, just having been at an institution prior to the release of the tri-agency open access policy, how it was really, really drilled into people. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's possible that, you know, we have researchers maybe who have been entering the system in the last few years uh, who were not around when all of that uh, intense work was done uh, just before the release of the policy. It's possible that all those folks got missed or many of them. Um, yeah, but still, or, or that, you know, folks were not necessarily uh, listening, that always happens as well. Um, yeah. I think sometimes because of the um, lack of clear compliance mechanisms for the tri-agency open access policy that folks' interest and um, attention to it kind of declines. Um, I know that we we hosted a number of different sessions. And I think we had over 120 people over it, you know, a period of months. And every time it was, well, what will actually happen if I don't comply with this requirement? And really, you know, beyond the broad answer that it's, it could be similar to any other non-compliance with a tri-agency policy. Um, I, yeah, I think folks get a little bit, you know, less attentive to, to things where they can't see, um, any direct reason 
um, for them to, to make extra effort. So we have a question from Dee Dee Dawson. Um, I've heard an anecdote about a publisher having a secondary copyright transfer agreement on hand in case authors dispute the first agreement. Did either of the publishers you spoke to mention something along these lines? I have also heard of this mythical secondary copyright transfer agreement, um, but neither of the publishers I spoke to um, mentioned anything along the lines of uh, uh, an a secondary agreement. Um, Publisher One did talk about um, uh, there being APC waivers available for folks um, in as a secondary method, sort of, you know, we can't allow you to have a 12 month or less embargo, um, but we could give you an APC waiver on, an, uh, on the open access method. So I think maybe that might be the way they're going, but it's definitely a, you have to ask or push um, it's not just thrown out there. And that does make sense that if they do have uh, an open access option, uh, that they have an economic incentive for not allowing the addendum. Um, here's another question. Thank you for the presentation. Would you be able to share a bit more um, about the 85 participants, whether these are graduate students, faculty, <laughs> institutions names. I don't know. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the demographics um, in terms of the uh, percentage of graduate students and faculty, um, I'd be able to share. Um, I can, I'll send you a, a link to the uh, DOI where the data is, um, but because of the um, limited number of people who participated, I've redacted the institution's names um, from the results. Um, but yes, definitely the, there are, there's other demographic information I've collected along with um, uh, like career stage um, and how many publications a person has uh, published that are included in the data and, and they, they're open for anyone to have a look at. Great, thank you. Uh, just in the chat, I see that Amanda Wackrek has uh, confirmed this rumor and said that she's worked with a faculty member who was indeed offered an alternate agreement um, after they mm. asked some questions about the original agreement. So there you go. Well, that's good There's news. a confirmation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have another quick question for you. Um, one thing I was wondering about is when you do work with authors, do you ask them about what it is that they are actually planning to do with the work and depending on what that is would you sometimes recommend they use fair dealing instead of bothering with an agreement uh with a alternate uh, yeah an alternate agreement interesting um i don't know i when i do talk to Usually when I talk to authors about what they want to do with their work, I talk to them about it in terms of look at your publishing agreement and see if it allows you to do what you want to with your work. Um, it's an interesting concept in terms of using fair dealing. I'm trying to think because you've signed away your rights as an author. And technically you'd be wanting to use the entire thing you would imagine. I'm trying to do a fair dealing analysis in my head. I mean, yeah. on the on the face of it, it seems like the risk would be almost nil in terms of actually applying that kind of argument um, to that sort of use. Because I mean, at the end of the day, I think publishers suing their own authors is is uh, is something I th other than the APA um, <laughs> uh, something that folks don't usually do. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I've not actually talked to researchers about taking a fair dealing approach to using their own work, but it's a it's an interesting solution for sure. It, it's just uh, it was a comment that was made when we were reviewing the author's uh, addendum. Um, somebody said, "Well, they don't really need this for most of the uses that are listed here. They could use fair dealing." So I thought that was an interesting uh, way yeah. to look at it. I mean, obviously. Uh, something like what Plan S is planning uh, would kind of change the conversation from the get-go yeah. if authors could retain their copyright um, at the start and have a CC sure. by license applied. I don't know if you have thoughts about, I know I'm putting you on the spot on this <laughs> new announcement. 
but what you think of this kind of a change in the landscape? Yeah, I, I had a, a brief look at it this morning. I think um, the the piece about uh, the Plan S, uh, the Coalition S, reaching out to publishers and making them aware of this requirement and um, trying to work with them uh, in a way to, you know, this is what we're doing. Tell us how you will support researchers um, that are supported by Plan S members. Um, that is the sort of the, the approach that I think is going to work in the long run um, in that we need funders to be using their power with publishers to make changes to their agreements. Um, I'm unsure about the applying of a CC by license to, um, to, the article, uh, to the accepted manuscript or the version of record as, as sort of a before you submit, you apply the CC by license and then it sort of carries through, um, especially if authors are then signing agreements afterwards that may sort of render that sort of null and void um, when you're transferring over things and you're saying, you know, this is an agreement between you and I and I'm telling you now you have my copyright. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly how that would work and I don't know that I, th I think individual authors might not be aware of the different implications of what they're doing in transferring their rights, um, which is, I think, the main problem is just folks not feeling comfortable enough to say, well, this already has a CC license, so we don't need to bother with this uh, transfer agreement. But yeah, it's definitely interesting. And I think yep. anything that they can do to, to change the landscape and make it easier for folks to keep their rights is great. Yeah, I think there'll be much more discussion on that to come. So there is another question, actually two, so let's go with this one. Uh, any differences between disciplines with large number of author groups and disciplines with single or small groups of authors? No, it uh, didn't look like there were any real differences between disciplines. Um, with, with 85 participants, there, there wasn't a whole lot of, of data to, to work with anyways, but um, there wasn't anything that stuck out as, you know, one discipline being, you know, I mean, with 86% of participants not being aware, there was no, nothing that stuck out about the eight uh, folks who were aware that, uh, that to call out, yeah. And we have another question asking whether, and I don't know if this is uh, just for you, Lauren, or for others who are uh, listening in, uh, whether lawyers are ever involved in copyright guidance in an institution. Um, so whether this means within the education sessions around the author agenda or more broadly. I can speak for at, at Waterloo, um, the, the stance taken by our legal office is that they represent um, the institution and not the instructors or faculty members at the institution. Mm -hmm. And so personal individual advice about uh, author agreements is not something that they um, offer. So I don't know if there are any last questions. I know, uh, oh, of course, just as I said that. <laughs> Uh, so you have a question from Danny at York. Thank you for the presentation. In anticipation of the start of talks on establishing transformative agreements with major publishers, I agree that CRKN could focus on asking for greater flexibility and or exceptions for tri-agency funded research to help with compliance. Any evidence from your review that points to consortia in other jurisdictions being especially successful with this approach? So don't know if you did any reading about consortial work in this area. No, no, I hadn't done any work, uh, any reading about consortial work in the area. The main reason I thought of CRCAN is just that they're the main group that I know of um, in Canada that has ongoing um, national relationships with major publishers. Um, so that's why I thought of them as a, a natural fit, but it could be that there are other groups like Carl or, um, uh, con can or whoever that might be better placed. And Danny's point is good though that uh, it's possible that in previous negotiations author rights wouldn't necessarily have been on the table or part of the discussion but as we're entering uh, the possibility of yeah. agreements that seems to 
make it less unlikely or uh, yeah unlikely. and with all of the transformative agreements happening in other uh in mainly your european consortia i imagine there's there's some that i one would hope that there was some research or some publication to to have a look at to see what they've done so unless another one pops up right away um, I think that might be the end of our questions, but this has been a really interesting discussion. Um, and uh, I've really appreciated your work, Lauren, and you're taking the time to join us today. So I, I don't, uh, I guess one last quick question. Do you have any plans to continue any work in this area or are there any next steps for your research? Um, uh, well, um, it's under review right now. Um, uh, for publication in uh, partnership. So we'll we'll see where that goes. And I like I say, I really would like to, um, when I have time, um, re redo the, the researcher survey, I think, uh, more broadly. And if there's anybody interested in um, uh, collaborating on something like that, I would be happy to do so. Because I think gathering more information, even about addenda, but then also about copy uh, researcher copyright knowledge and behaviors is it would be good to have for the Canadian context. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you everyone who joined us today. Merci à tous de nous.